can then share it more broadly with the wider community following tonight's uh, session. I also wish to begin by acknowledging the Wadarong people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which many of us will be uh, meeting today, but also acknowledge that there might be others from uh, wider and broader communities, and I pay my respects to the local owners and elders, both past, present and future. The UN's 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence is a global campaign that takes place annually uh, from late November uh, to mid-December each year. Gender-based violence includes all forms of violence against people based on their gender or violence that affects people of a particular gender disproportionately. It's most frequently described uh, as men's violence against women, but it also includes violence against other people within our community, including the LGBTIQA community who face discrimination and violence on the basis of sex, sexuality, or gender identity at alarming rates. Golden Plain Shire is proud to support this valuable initiative, and we believe that it's our role to continue to promote uh, respect and equality and create an environment where people feel safe and live free from violence. Tonight, we have the pleasure of welcoming Nellie Thomas as our keynote speaker. Nellie is an Australian comedian and author, uh, an award-winning career beginning with uh, a stand-up comedian uh, comedy in, in the early uh, 2000s and has taken her all over the world as she appears regularly on Australian television and radio. Nellie was listed as Australia's most innovative thinkers in the age and features uh, featured on ABC's Big Ideas. Nellie again is a diverse person with uh, getting involved in pod, pod podcasts in, in 2020 and is also an author uh, of both children and adult uh, books. Welcome Nellie and uh, we look forward to your presentation tonight and I can't wait to hear the stories that you'll tell us and uh, inform us of, of how we can become wiser uh, and more informed. Thank you very much and we welcome you. Oh, I appreciate that so much Eric. Thank you for that very kind introduction and can I say, you know, to Felicity, to the rest of the team, um, to Eric as well as the CEO, you know, it, it brings me great joy to see organisations like yours addressing these kinds of issues. Um, anyone who's worked in this space for a long time knows that it's relatively recent um, and it's a really welcome change, you know, to see organisations that are not directly service providers, for example, um, taking this prevention issue really seriously. So, and can I give a special shout out, of course, to Felicity and to Sam, um, because it's very 2020, but the, you know, the tech stuff is doing everyone's head in, especially as we're limping toward Christmas. Um, I don't think Felicity can see, but let's do it in spirit of doing a little, you know, Auslan clap. Thank you for all your work. Now you just chill and I'll take over and everything's going to be all right. <laughs> now, um, I am going to share my screen. I'm assuming I'm going to be able to share my screen. It'll be interesting if I can't. I think that I can. Uh, let me see. New slideshow. There we go. Now, if that didn't work, um, someone's going to have to let me know in the chat. Let me see. In okay. fact... Yeah, Lisa, can good. you unmute yourself and just let me know? Because I can't see anyone. Is that working? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, fantastic. Um, now, I apologies to those of you who kind of work in this sector because I'm going to be covering some ground that I think some of you will already be aware of. But as you'd know, in this space, you can make no assumptions. Um, so I'll be going over a range of things. I'm also not going to talk just about the 16 days of activism. So I feel like we need to just, you know, 2020 has been huge. We need to have just a bit of a chat and um, a bit of a relax. It's also night time. So, you know, settle in and we will try as much as it is an incredibly serious topic. We'll also try to have, you know, if not a jovial chat, at least a pleasant one. Um, Okay, so the format, I'm going to introduce myself and my family. I'm going to talk about gender with a focus on kids' stories. The reason I do that is for two reasons. One, it's to give the discussion a focus because we could be here, you know, this could be a training module that goes for years. Uh, I'm just going to focus in on one area, but also being a children's author, obviously it's an area that I know well. 
Um, I'm going to talk about some practical strategies for promoting gender equality. And I do that really deliberately because I personally, I get a little bit frustrated when I hear presentations um, about uh, the theory and the ethics and all of those, the research and the, the wonderful things, all the things that we need, but I want to know what to do. Um, so I will try and offer my perspective on that. And I'll use my three kids books that I've written so far, just as one example to talk you through my thinking in terms of addressing these issues in a practical way. If we've got time at the end, um, I'll take some questions as well. Obviously, I won't be able to hear or see you. If you have questions throughout the presentation, maybe just pop them in the chat. And um, if we have time, I will get to those at the end. So as you already know um, from Eric's introduction, the night's presented by Golden Plain Shire. And again, um, thank you for putting events like this on. One of the things I think is interesting to reflect on in 2020 when pandemic is the, you know, word of the year, um, is that we also know that gender-based violence is a pandemic and has been uh, for a very, very long time. And even something as simple as the disproportionate effect of coronavirus pandemic on women and girls is something that we should be reflecting on. And I'll come back to that. Now, as I've said already, technical problems are a kind of a thing, <laughs> obviously, in 2020. I actually come from a little town originally. I live in uh, Melbourne now, but I come from a little town in the Western Australian wheat belt called Meriden. So I have been doing a lot of Skyping um, with a lot of relatives and the technical problems have been one of the biggest challenges of 2020. I've seen a lot of my mum and dad's nostrils and there's been a lot of you're on mute, you're on mute and the Wi-Fi's, you know, broken down and all sorts of things, all the things we know. Look, it's it's an evening, it's a lovely day. Um, if something happens technically, I'd just say just take a deep breath, um, you know, have a sippy glass of wine, whatever it is that you're doing, rejoin, you know, we'll be all right, we'll be all right. First things first, I think I saw in the promotion for tonight's event that they used this, if I do say so myself, lovely publicity photo that was taken after I'd had professional hair and makeup done and by a lovely photographer. Um, let's be honest, 2020 hasn't been kind. This is me. Mm, I think that was probably about a month into the first lockdown. Um, I had enough. I thought I can't keep dyeing my hair blonde. It's too irritating. Got rid of all the hair. Let the kids do the makeup. Um, let's be real. It hasn't been kind to any of us. I got very irritated with the sourdough. I'm guessing some of you were quite into the whole sourdough scenario. I did try, um, you know, I felt pressure to try and make sourdough. This was the loaf I made. Uh, as you can see, it didn't work out very well. I got kind of flustered and um, felt a little bit bad about that until I realised you could get sourdough from the shops. You know, you can buy bread. Uh, and I think the lesson I'll take away from 2020 is to aim lower, you know, that's how you succeed in happiness in life is to lower your expectations somewhat. One of the interesting things I found, obviously, I've been a comedian for nearly 20 years. I've worked a lot in health promotion spaces um, before that and as a comedian. And so I'm on a lot of mailing lists, you know, and the messages I kept getting, how we should cope would be things like, you know, playing board games with the kids and maybe you could learn to jog, you know, do the zero to 5K and cook lovely meals with the family and read or even write a novel, maybe learn a new language. Remember someone suggesting maybe I could learn Auslan. Um, I'm all about truth. So I'm going to tell you how we actually coped, not just me, but uh, research is coming in now <laughs> that this was a relatively universal experience. A lot of us ate too much. You know, I'll put my hand up for that. There were days I would make cakes just so I could eat the icing. Um, a lot of us probably had a few more drinks than what we normally would. Not recommending it. I'm just saying it is uh, a fact. Uh, a lot of us did a lot more online shopping than we would normally do. That can be fraught, as you can see. Um, I did buy that sports top. It did say an extra large. I'm not sure what body they were basing that on, but clearly I had to send that back. Um, and there were times for any of you who homeschooled, whew, homeschooling two kids in lockdown, in a Melbourne lockdown winter wasn't easy. There were times I hid in the shed. 
And uh, again, not proud of it, just being honest. I have two kids, two girls. As you can probably see from this photo, they are very different girls and that'll be part of my discussion tonight. My girl number one, I guess, um, you know, she's more complicated than a stereotype, but I guess she fits into the stereotype of what we think of as a little girl. Like this is for her like day wear, you know, this is like going down to the milk bar kind of outfit. The room's pink, the bedspread's pink. Um, Mum, when can I have a Barbie? I remember she wanted a Barbie when she was young and I wasn't keen on Barbies, you know, all the stereotypes about Barbies and the role model and whatever. Uh, we end up relenting because Barbies are like cockroaches. You know, they just get in the house regardless of whether or not you're trying to keep them out. But I did have a rule, Barbie had to have a job, right? So she ended up with a number of Barbies, you know, an engineer, a doctor, or a cleaner, a whole range of things. So. She fits in what we think of as the girl stereotype. Now, my other daughter absolutely does not. Um, when she was little, uh, when I say little, she's only eight now, when she was invited to her first princess party, she wore this, when as Darth Vader and did that, you know, walked in much to the bemusement of the parents. <laughs> uh, the other kids are more accepting, which I think is an interesting note, but the parents found that quite uncomfortable. Um, she got invited to a mermaid party and went as Captain America. And this theme continued. You know, she's uh, that's just how she rolls. I thought I'd share this with you just as a bit of fun. During lockdown, she decided she would write a novel and uh, she entitled it The Buttocks of the Human Butt. And the entire story is about a guy who basically passes wind and destroys a city. So that's that's the kind of kid we're talking about. Very, very different, the two of them. Now, they're both Generation V, which I didn't even know existed until I had to look it up. Um, I can tell you they can do a lot of things. Like kids are really interesting. Uh, if any of you have got kids or grandkids in this age, you'll know what the Ender Dragon is. They know how to slay it. They can name all the Norris nuts. Um, that is actually a family. It's not a food stuff. They can disable the parental controls on YouTube. Anyone who tells you they can't is dreaming. They can express their feelings, which is lovely. I was a child of the 70s and 80s. We didn't have feelings, so it's nice that they can express them. They can quote the Geneva Convention, you know, very well aware of their rights. What's interesting, though, there's some stuff they can't do. The main one I've noticed is they have a lot of memory problems. You know, when your kids come home from school and you're like, so what'd you do maths today? Can't remember. What'd you have for lunch? Can't remember. Did you talk to anyone? Can't remember. Interesting. Uh, what's my iTunes password? Nelly250pinky underscore backslash. Hmm, that you can remember. Hmm, interesting. But I remember getting up one day in lockdown, looking on the fridge, and they'd put a little note on the fridge. Bless. My mum's the best in the world. And you can fact check that. That is not fake news. That is absolutely true. I am the best mum in the world. Flawed, but I'm doing my best. Now, the 16 days of activism. Um, what is the 16, 16 days of activism? Now, again, some of you are already, already know this, um, but I know that some of you are new to this space, so I'll just go through it quickly. Eric's already mentioned that it's related to gender-based violence, and this refers to harmful acts that are directed at an individual based on their gender. It's estimated that one in three women, um, this, this is just one example, will experience sexual or physical violence mm -hmm. in their lifetime. Now, why that's important, um, obviously for a range of reasons, but the 16 days is not talking about violence in general. It is talking about gender-based violence, and we'll go into that uh, a little bit more. How is gendered violence? And I find, I know we've got some practitioners um, who have joined us, and this is one of the questions when I do presentations on this stuff, usually the first question will be, well, why is it any different to any other kind of violence? And I think it's important um, that we don't kind of roll our eyes at that or assume that that, e that question is provocative even or an attack. I think it's important to just answer that question. Um, one of the most obvious things is that most gender-based violence is done, if not in the home, it is done by people known um, to the person. By contrast, something like, you know, the famous campaign around the um, coward's punch or the one punch laws or what we think of as kind of pub violence, that kind of generalised community violence is very different in nature and location. 
and it may not involve someone known to the person. There's a different psychology, there's a different location, therefore different methods of prevention. The type of violence is different. So obviously women are far more likely to experience sexual violence and sexualized violence um, is very different to, again, if we think of a generalized community violence um, in the street uh, or usually between men um, is usually not, obviously can be, but usually not sexualized violence. Women are more likely to experience violence by an intimate partner or an ex-partner. In other words, by a boyfriend, by a husband, or by an ex-boyfriend or ex-husband, which again is a very different relationship in terms of the violence um, that's perpetrated than a stranger or even a friend. Women are more likely to be hospitalized, killed by or afraid of an intimate partner or ex. I think the hospitalised and killed by are self-evidently awful. Um, one of the things that I think we perhaps don't talk about enough is the or afraid bit. And this idea that um, violence has been normalised, um, that it is normal for women and girls to be afraid, you know, the keys between the finger, the um, hypervigilance, around being on public transport or leaving the house or all of the things that we know about um, has been normalised. That fear is a really important part of this discussion. Also the drivers of the violence. Um, for those who are new to the space, the researchers and the professionals in this area don't like to say causes because it implies this happens, then this happens and there's a direct cause. Um, so drivers is, I find it a difficult term because it's kind of like saying causes, but not making that direct, um, if you do this, this will definitely happen. We can maybe talk more about that after, but the drivers of the violence um, are different. And I think, again, for practitioners in this area, I think, you know, I hate that phrase, the pub test. How often have we heard that this year? Um, particularly, ironically, in this context, but I think it passes the pub test to be able to say to people, you know, the things that cause a, a, a pub brawl or a fight of the kind that you're seeing in this picture are self-evidently and on a common sense level different to, and again, I'm just going to use stereotype and shorthand, um, are self-evidently different to a man who beats his wife regularly um, or who abuses his family. Like they're clearly very different situations and have very different drivers behind them. Now, the perpetrator um, is clearly gendered. So around 95% of victims of violence, and that includes men and women, experience violence from a male perpetrator. This is a really hard area, I think, to talk about because, and I understand this, I think sometimes men feel really stereotype themselves or even attacked in that discussion when you point this out. My response to that would be that if we don't understand the problem, then we don't find the solution, all right? There is a reason that the overwhelming majority of perpetrators are men. Um, and if we don't acknowledge that, then we're not going to do anything um, to solve this absolutely tragic epidemic. Why am I passionate about preventing violence against women? Um, obviously, for a range of reasons, um, aside from the fact that I'm committed to social justice uh, and have worked in this area for a long time. I have personal reasons as well. Both my grandmothers were victims of family violence. Um, my beautiful Nana Gladys, who's I think to the right of your screen, had 12 children. Um, raised them mostly as a single mother, um, experienced family violence. My paternal grandmother also had um, horrendous family violence. And while she did not, um, forgive me for being so blunt in the language here, she was not murdered, uh, but she absolutely died prematurely as a result of family violence. In fact, she died at around my age. Um, and as often happens, I think, in this space, very sadly for me and mostly for her, I don't even have a photo of her. You know, she has in some sense has been erased from the family history and I find that absolutely unacceptable um, but is something that you will hear repeated in, in family violence sectors. 
I'm going to make a few assumptions tonight. Um, I always try and start from positive base. I'm going to start from the assumption that you want the best for your kids and that you want the best for my kids. Whether you have kids or not, I mean kids in the sense of kids in your life and in your orbit and in your community um, and for my kids. I'm going to make an assumption that you believe rigid gender stereotypes are harmful and you want to challenge them and I'll go into that more. Um, but if you don't already accept that, I think it's going to be difficult for me to convince you um, otherwise. And I'm going to make an assumption that you accept the research. Now, I will come back to this one because I think it's a major assumption um, to assume that you accept the research. It's such a fraught kind of area and a lot of people have a lot of opinions about it. There's layers and layers of culture. There's layers and layers of history. Um, there's a lot of pub chat, there's a lot of Christmas dinner chat, there's a lot of family chat. It's a very heated area and quite frankly, often people are getting it very, very wrong. So I try to go to the experts. Um, for example, violence against women is the biggest contributor to ill health and premature death in women aged 15 to 44 in Victoria. Now that's a research finding by very clever people, professors, doctors, PhDs, from Vic Health, we're not talking a fringe group. We're not talking a group with a vested interest. We're talking the Victorian Health Promotion Agency, and they have led the world in this research. I believe them. I hope you believe them as well. Let's also look at the stat. We're talking more contribution to premature death and ill health than car accidents, than smoking, than obesity, than the things that we understand as being um, wrong and harmful. The drivers of violence against women, and again, this comes from the research, condoning violence against women, obviously that makes sense if we just kind of go, yeah, it's perfectly fine. Um, you would all know in my grandmother's age, no one would have cared that there was family violence. In fact, it would have been normal. Um, there certainly weren't services that you could go to. It would have been odd for a woman to leave a violent relationship Men's control of decision making, um, both at home and in public life. So if we have the assumption that men head a household, that only women, that, you know, women should just be at home, that women can't be prime ministers or any range of things in communities where we think men should be in charge, the research is very clear that we see higher levels of violence against women and girls. Rigid gender roles, and I'll go into what that is because it kind of feels a little bit like jargon. Um, rigid gender roles and stereotype constructions of masculinity and femininity are drivers against men and women. In other words, if you're in a community, regardless of religion, socioeconomic background, um, cultural difference, whatever it is, if there's a really firm idea, this is how you have to be a man, man up, this is how you have to be a woman, be pretty, you know, be, be sweet. If those things are really rigidly adhered to, you are going to have higher levels of violence. Um, against women and girls. Male peer relations that emphasise aggression and disrespect toward women. In other words, if men bond um, over putting women down or being really sexist or being really crude or whatever, and that's not to say all jokes are off um, and that everything's wrong, but if that's the way that men bond with each other, then we've got a problem. So I aim to challenge the rigid gender roles. I think that's the area that I'm most effective in. And I do that for three reasons. One, it's just fair, you know, it's just fair. Like gender equality is just fair. Human beings should be judged on, you know, their character and their talents and their personality and what they bring to the world and, and not their gender or the sex that they were born into. Um, also, because as I've said, I'm very passionate about um, violence prevention against women and girls. And I know that those things are connected. Another reason I'm passionate about it is because I think, and this is really starting to become part of the conversation now, it's also becoming very clear that those gender roles, and kind of we've been saying this for a long time, but we've got more research to back it up now, those gender roles are really bad for men too. So one of the other um, absolutely devastating health pandemics in Australia, and forgive me, I'm trigger warning and talking about self-harm here, um, but is suicide among men, among men and boys and adolescent boys. 
And it's so clear that if we tell boys to man up and to not have feelings and, you know, that if you reach out and tell someone you're struggling that, you know, you're a, and again, forgive the language, you're a poofta or, you know, all of those kinds of negative homophobic, sexist, misogynist things that we hear, these hurt boys as well. And we see that in, in the epidemics of poor mental health and suicide among men and boys. Um, one thing I think we forget to do a little bit, we kind of assume everyone knows what gender stereotypes are. So I don't think that's true. That's not my experience of it. Um, in general terms, you know, the, those stereotypes that are still there around women and girls being kind of helpful, you know, and pretty and caring and emotional and good, you know, and shy and maybe not taking up space and that kind of stuff. And men and boys that, you know, messy and hard and strong and brave and wild and a bit loud and maybe at its most extreme violent. Um, it's those things that, you know, we still hear, like you hear, a, I don't know, a bunch of footballers who have behaved um, in an appalling way, maybe even assaulted each other or some women. Um, and we still do hear those excuses like, oh, boys will be boys. You know, that's what they do um, rather than being held accountable for their actions. One of the most heartbreaking ones for me is the idea that boys don't cry. Um, again, going back to mental health, even the phrase act like a man, you know, what does that even mean when we start to unpack that? I think we realise it's actually pretty brutal. And the everydayness of these kinds of attitudes um, can mask them. You know, I think... It's funny, isn't it? During 2020, we've realised a lot of things we took for granted um, were just not true. And a lot of things that we think are sort of embedded um, or, or natural even are kind of constructs. And the everydayness of, of the stereotyping, um, I think, is something we need to look at. For example, Christmas coming up, might be Hanukkah, could be Chinese New Year, whatever it is you celebrate. The other day, so I would have done this maybe two days ago, you can see from the little tabs up the top of the kind of stuff I was looking at, um, I literally just Googled boys' toys, you know, thinking a lot of people are doing that at the moment for Christmas. What do we see? Construction, boxing, active play, Lego, cars, motorbikes. This is 2020, all right? This is not 1970. This is 2020. Um, this is what boys like, apparently all boys um, what are girls like? Girls' toys, makeup, babies, um, taking care of babies and children and a little cot and someone's going out with a purse and she's got pretty glasses on. Now, I hasten to add, if your girl happens to like this stuff or your boy happens to like the other stuff, that's not the point. The point is how it is marketed, um, the assumptions that are made about boys and girls and what they will like. This doesn't just reflect what they like, it creates what they like. It doesn't just reflect culture, it creates culture. We see this in adult culture as well and kids are exposed to that, which is another thing I think we forget in this discussion. Now, I'm revealing far too much about myself here, but I'm a mad Survivor fan, right? I love really bad reality TV. So in lockdown, I've been watching Survivor New Zealand and I thought, why not? It's as good an example as any. Um, just as one example, most of you probably haven't seen it, but um, I find it really interesting in something like this. So the whole point of the game is basically to deceive to win, you know, but without fail, if you're a Survivor fan, you will know that the way that the men doing that, i.e. lying and pretending and getting around and blindsiding people is referred to as solid, solid gameplay. When the women do that, especially younger women, which I find interesting, they're considered manipulative or deceitful or tricky. Um, so the exact same behaviour are characterised in different ways. The way they define strength I find very interesting. So they do challenges, often they're physical challenges, but strength, physical strength is, de is defined as, you know, how big your muscles are, whether you can lift something up, whereas a lot of the women are particularly good at endurance challenges. So my favourite Survivor moment ever was when Tina Wesson, season one of the American Survivor held her, she was a 52-year-old woman, I think, held her arm up in the air for nine hours in order to win a challenge. Like her endurance was phenomenal. And yet still, because she was small 
and because she didn't look like what we consider strength, she was not characterised as one of the strong players. Um, childbirth is a whole other thing, don't even get me into that, but how do we define physical strength, let alone if we start talking emotional strength? How the women are talked about, um, this broke my heart. One of the young, younger women um, told one of the older women to go back to her knitting. Turns out women can be sexist to each other as well. Uh, one of the guys referred to one of the women who wouldn't do something that he wanted as, you know, it was like being on a holiday but with someone's angry missus. And again, we're talking these are probably would consider, most of them would consider themselves quite progressive and in 2020. We also look at the raw numbers, who goes first. Almost every season of Survivor, the first three or four people voted off will be women and they will, considered, they will be considered weak, um, whether they are or not. But look, the primary source of this sort of stuff, and I think this is good news and bad news, is home. So our watch, who have done some amazing research in this area, uh, have, have found that research confirms that families, and in particular parents, are young children's first and primary source of information and learning about gender, which I can tell you as a parent is kind of terrifying because it's a big responsibility, um, but also a relief given that, you know, they're going to be exposed to pink aisle and blue aisle and, you know, all the other things that they're exposed of. So we do have some power. One of the interesting things, and I think it's important for us to be honest in this space as well, is that most parents do actually believe that girls and boys should be treated equally, um, but that they are often, myself included, even as someone who's working in this space and has dedicated my life to this space, they will often inadvertently or subtly reinforce gender stereotypes and different treatment of boys and girls. And again, I think rather than feeling blame when we talk about that, I think we just have to be honest about it. As I said, I am like in like Flynn. I am in this area. This is my thing. And I will say hand on heart, I have done this in my parenting. Okay, so let alone if it's not something that you're um, thinking about day to day. So I wanted to give you some practical tips. Now I say this um, with no expertise whatsoever, just a lot of experience working in this area, okay? So this is just how I handle it. I think of it in terms of three levels, right? The first one, um, I like to use plain language. The first one is, mm, that's weird. The second one is, why? And the third one, forgive the language, is blow shit up, all right? And proportionately, when we're talking about this area, most of it's weird. I'm going to explain what all this means. A big chunk of it's why and a small percentage of it is blow shit up. What do I mean by those things? Firstly, that's weird. So my sense is that you get far more traction when you're dealing with kids or anyone, to be frank, if instead of when you see something you don't like, instead of going straight to DEFCON 5, instead of going straight to that's wrong and you got it wrong and you're sexist and you're misogynist, um, or you're a terrible person, or you're a bad parent, or you're a bad kid, is just to kind of notice it, to note it. So for example, I'm just going to give you some examples from this year. One of my kids saw, this is Will Smith, he was on his wife, uh, on her talk show, he cried, and then all these memes went around about Will Smith crying. And I remember one of my kids showed it to me, I just went, that's weird. Like, why would anyone make fun of a man for crying? Another example, I'm um, giving you far too much information about what my family does day to day, but um, we were watching Ocean's Eleven and one of the kids were like, oh, there's no girls. I think Julia Roberts is in it. There was one girl. And again, do I want to ruin movie night? You know, do I want to turn the movie off? Do I want to say we can't enjoy it? No, I just go, that's weird, isn't it? Like, why aren't there any girls? Um, another one, oh, this one's hard to keep it that's weird, but you know when someone sort of accidentally, usually is accidental, it's not usually said, said with malice, says, oh, you throw like a girl or you do something like a girl. Um, my approach in that case would just be, that's a weird thing to say. What does that mean, throw like a girl? So challenge without, um, I guess, without aggression. The next level up, I think, is to then ask questions, all right? And if we're thinking, I assume most of you are going into some sort of family gathering in the next few weeks, 
and this one might help you you know because i found certainly when i was in my early 20s i would just be like challenge 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 and then no one wants nelly at christmas lunch anymore right but I can't just let it go either. I don't think that's um, that's right. So I think a good one is to ask why. So for example, um, I'm not into banning books. I'm more than happy for my kids to read any books, but I want them to engage critically. So you're reading The Magic Faraway Tree, one of my favourite books. Um, but why is the boy responsible for looking after the girls? Why is that stated? Why does he not have to do the dishes? Uh, why is he presented in a different way with different responsibilities? Get them to start thinking about it. You're sitting at Christmas lunch and, I don't know, your mother-in-law, an auntie, an uncle, a family friend um, says, you know, why isn't your daughter wearing a dress? Or you should be, you should have a different haircut or don't be so bossy or whatever it is. Again, my approach in that case, depending on what they said, obviously, uh, would be to either ask them or to the kids, why do you think they said that? What do you think's behind that? Get them to think critically and do that work rather than telling them what's happening. Another example from this year was, would be Taylor Harris. So obviously she did this amazing feat of athleticism and then was trolled. My kids aren't really old enough for this one, but if you had teenagers or in your discussion with adults, why was she trolled? What was the nature of the trolling? Why was the criticism criticism of her so sexualized? Why were there critiques of her body? You know, actually start to unpack rather than just go, that's wrong. That's wrong. Why are people making, you know, people are making fun of her. And then there's that level where you've got to blow shit up. You know, the way I think of it, I'm an NBA fan. All right. I love basketball. Sometimes you've got to throw an elbow. OK, sometimes you're just going to have to get in there. You're going to hear from far more expert people after me on this, on, on how to get in there. I'm just giving you my take. So my youngest daughter, the one who did the Darth Vader and the whole thing, when she was about three, started wanting, she had long hair and she wanted her hair cut short. We went to two different hairdressers on the same day who refused to cut her hair. Um, they even did things like, you can't do that to her. You can't do that to her. How could you do that to a little girl? One, um, the third one actually agreed to do it, but she made me get permission of her manager uh, to the point where I said to her, you know, like a short haircut, you know, like Winona Ryder. And then she said, who's Winona Ryder? And I felt very old. The whole thing was really traumatic. And that was an example where I felt I had to set an example for my daughter. And I did blow shit up in the sense that I spoke to the manager and expressed my disappointment and my outrage. When someone's getting bullied, obviously you don't just kind of let that go, you get in there, you know, when it's really harmful. Um, when someone's minimising violence, I absolutely will not tolerate that. I'm prepared to go from zero, zero to 100 if someone's going to minimise um, family violence, sexual violence, any kind of violence really. Certainly, if someone's going to perpetuate a stereotype about that kind of violence, so that sort of she was asking for it, what was she wearing, what was she doing there, why doesn't she leave, maybe she just likes men like that, that kind of stuff, I will go in. Not everyone feels like they can. Again, you're going to get more tips and advice after I speak from people who really know what they're talking about in this space. Um, but for me, that's the blow shit up kind of area where I will go in um, if it's if I feel it's necessary. But my main strategy, and I think that this covers, this actually does a lot of work, is mm, that just makes no sense to me. So that is quite a profound challenge when it's done repeatedly. Now, conscious challenge, and this is where I'm just looking at the time, um, where I made a conscious challenge in terms of writing my kids' books to be really deliberately looking at gender issues and gender stereotypes. I will hasten to add, I wanted to make sure I am a comedian first and foremost. So, uh, and, I am a, and I'm a mum. So I wanted to make sure that the books were also light and fun and beautiful, but I wanted every single image and every single word to have, I guess, a gendered lens. So this is the first book I wrote, Some Girls. And as you can probably see from the cover, there's, you know, there's a lot of diversity in the books. Um, that's very deliberate. deliberate. To give you, I can't go through all the pages, but I just thought I'd pull a few out and you could see my thinking um, as an idea, to give you some ideas about how you might challenge gender stereotypes as well. 
So one of the things I think we've really got to get our head around is what does it mean for women and girls to be angry? Because anger is normal. <laughs> anger is something that women and girls need permission um, to feel. That doesn't mean they can express that anger in unhelpful ways, um, but we need to let women and girls feel it. So this whole idea, you know, these double standards I talked about, like if a man is the boss, whereas a woman's seen as being bossy, or, you know, if what I would consider assertive might be read um, as aggressive because we expect women and girls to be submissive. So one of the pages in the book is all girls get mad sometimes. Something as simple as that. Honour girls' uh, fury because, quite frankly, like any other human being, they have every right to feel anger and express it. Another issue, same, the idea that men can take caring roles. So women, girls, men, boys, other, everyone, we need to start talking more about the fact that men can care, that men can care for children, that men can care for other men, that men can care for themselves, and to really normalise that for, for boys and men. Um, Another issue, and again, I'm just picking random ones out of that first book, the idea that girls' bodies are not weak. Okay, so again, challenging the very idea of what strength means, challenging the idea that strength's always physical. As you will see, uh, not just in terms of gender, but in a whole range of other areas, I wanted to include diversity. I, I want to point out that I very deliberately have a couple of kids in here um, who have disabilities who are playing. Again, if we're going to think about stereotypes, so much children's literature, if it has any kids with disabilities, which are often they're completely invisible, um, but if they are in there, it'll be they're being cared for, you know, or they might be sitting in the corner and someone's being nice to them. I, I was having none of that. I wanted to make sure that kids with disabilities and a whole range of kids were part of the action, in there, having fun, um, you know, really mucking up with all the other kids. Now, the next book I wrote was Some Boys. Basically, the reason I wrote that is because everywhere I toured some girls, little boys would quite rightly go, where's our book, right? So <laughs> that came next. It's very similar, um, but with different emphasis, because I think one of the biggest areas we've got to do work on for young boys um, and teenagers as well is emotional literacy. One area I think we need to look at in terms of that, in terms of stereotypes, is play. So if we've got any kinder teachers or early childhood educators, you'll know that even when a centre, for example, a childcare centre offers, you know, there's a kitchen corner and there's a, um, I don't know, there's a shop over here and there's all the different things, often little boys and girls will just play among all of those, um, but the parents struggle with it. So it's not uncommon for kinder teachers to be told, well, I don't want my boy playing with dolls. Why have you got him playing with dolls? Or I don't want my girl doing that. Uh, and I think if we can try and challenge that in, in gentle ways, someone said to me the other day, which I thought was beautiful, when she was challenged, she's a kinder teacher, and she had a dad kind of going, well, what, what you know, why have you given my son a, a, a doll to play with? And she said to him, he plays like that because that's how he sees you. He sees you as a good dad who's caring and loving. And I thought, what a perfect, beautiful response. So here's another page from the boys' book. Some boys like gentle things. Some boys like rough, rough things. Some boys like pretty things. Some boys like tough things. So as I said at the beginning, and um, I think it's important to repeat over and over, it's not prescriptive. You know, it's not, I don't think anyone who works in this space is saying, if you have a boy, you must make him want to put a little ribbon in his hair. You must make him like playing with dolls. That's not the point. The point is to honour all the differences. And if they do want to explore playing with a doll or, I don't know, dressing up a little teddy or something like that, they're not shamed for it either overtly or kind of accidentally. Um, another big issue, I think, is that feminine things are not bad. Um, any of you of my vintage will know that one of the most controversial things, in fact, I saw David Beckham, this is David Beckham and Victoria Beckham, I saw him interviewed recently, and they asked him about the biggest scandal of his career, and he said this, 
right, this was a photo. They went out to the movies or some premiere or something and he wore a skirt. It's a sarong. But anyway, he wore this and was completely lambasted and lampooned. Imagine it was before social media, so you can imagine what would happen now. But the idea that, you know, dressing like a girl is a bad thing has two assumptions. One, it's homophobic, I think. Um, but also there's the assumption that feminine things are bad. So surprise, surprise, this is a, a page from my boy's book. When I do media interviews about the book, which page do you think everyone asks about? Yes, it is this. Um, some boys wear shirts and some boys wear skirts. So, yes, there is a boy. In fact, there's another boy as well. There's two boys in the book who are wearing skirts um, or, or sarongs as well. I find it really interesting that it's so provocative. To me, it's just a statement of fact. You know, some boys do wear skirts. Fact. The fact that we get so worked up about it, that it provokes so much emotion, um, tells me something about gender in the first place. It's also culturally specific. As we all know, there have been moments in history where men have worn skirts and dresses. There are various cultures. Um, even now, where men wear um, what you'd consider skirts, sarongs, dresses and all sorts of things. But there's something in the heightened emotion that tells us something about how worried we are about a boy dressing like a girl. I think it's something to do with him being perceived as giving up power. Um, and there's definitely some underlying homophobia in there. Now, this one I'm really passionate about. Boys deserve to feel and we need to help them understand their feelings. One thing that drives me absolutely nuts is when you hear discussions about teenage boys and young men sort of in their 20s who go, oh, they've got no emotional literacy, you know, and they don't listen and they're not being kind and they're not being caring. And yet they've been subjected often to, you know, zero to 10 being told boys should be boys and don't cry and toughen up and you'll be right, mate. Come on, little boss, you're all right, um, whether in overt or more subtle ways. So this is another one of the pages from the book. All boys get sad sometimes. Normal to get sad. Normal to feel comfort, to need comfort. Normal to get that comfort from another man. Normal to cry. Normal to have feelings. All boys get mad sometimes. Again, no point telling boys not to have anger. Of course they should have ang ang anger. They're humans. What you do with that anger is the issue. All boys are shy sometimes. So again, this stereotype that boys should, by their nature, be confident. By their nature, should be able to walk into a room and hold the room and be in command and be a leader. Nonsense. We know some boys are followers, some boys are leaders, some boys are shy, some are confident. To honour all those things and to challenge the stereotypes. Um, now, I did, I have got a third book. One of my kids is autistic. Um, she's fantastic and really interesting brain. And I wrote a book for her called Some Brains and it carries on a lot of the themes. But I was just conscious of time tonight. And given that it wasn't specifically about gender, I thought I wouldn't dwell on it. But if any of you are interested um, in any of the books, you can find them on somekidsbooks.com um, or you can just find them if you Google me. I wanted to sort of end by saying, I think for me, it's really interesting having two girls who are so radically different, right? So one of them often gets mistaken for a boy. Um, sometimes she wants that corrected, sometimes she doesn't. I think often she just like can't be bothered and just goes with the flow. Um, but what I find interesting is seeing how differently people talk to both of them. So you definitely get with the with the little one um, on the right there, definitely get the, hey, boss, oh, look at those muscles. You're so, so, and I'm talking like in a cafe, you know, talking for like complete strangers. It's all about like strength and physicality and all of that kind of stuff. Whereas my other daughter, it's very much the way she's spoken to is, aren't you sweet? What a, what a sweet, kind girl. Aren't you lovely? And you know what? She is sweet and she is lovely and she is kind. She's also really strong. Uh, and my other girl's also very tough and kind and sweet and all of those things. But I feel like I've almost got like a weird inside kind of lens watching how differently they're treated, if that makes sense. Look, in summary, I think, as I said, the good news is we have enormous power. 
um, we can actually change things. Things have changed radically. Whenever I feel despondent, and I often do, um, at the stats and the news, I think I go back to my grandmother's and I think imagine like just within a couple of generations, the difference in terms of how family violence is framed, the difference in the opportunities. They couldn't have got a bank loan. You know, they weren't allowed to work once they got married. You know, a whole range. We know all of these things. These are radical changes um, that have happened relatively quickly when you look at a, you know, you pull back and look at a historical lens. So we do have power. Violence is gendered, and I think it's really important that we don't allow the discussion to be watered down into a all violence is bad. That's self-evident. Of course, all violence is bad. But violence against women and girls is different, and it needs to be prevented in different ways. We need to know the stereotypes, the gendered stereotypes, what are they, and commit to challenging them. Unless we're reminding ourselves, because they're so normalised, unless we're reminding ourselves, we will not challenge them. And we need to do that consciously. Um, for me, my approach, after many years of refining it, is to pick your battles and your methods. And as I said, for me, the way I understand that is, mm, that's weird. And then asking why, and then blowing shit up when necessary. Um, I don't know if we've got, oh, we've got like four minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if we had any questions. Um, there we go. Did we have any questions, Felicity, in the chat? I'm just having a quick look. Let me see. No, look, it's a bit, you can put questions in the chat. It's a little bit unusual because I can't see you. <laughs> or I can't hear. If I could see and hear you, I'd be very happy to take questions. If you did want, if anyone wants to put them in the chat, they can. Or is it, Eric, are you about to ask a question? Is that what's happening? <laughs> no, but look, thank you very much, Nellie. And we really appreciated um, the insightful presentation uh, this evening. And I'm sure that everyone listening will have heard a number of things they would, would have been able to directly relate to. Um, and I think it's, it's all those practical examples um, that hopefully will go back to, you know, tomorrow morning, you know, you're sitting down, you know, having the coffee and you'll be able to reflect upon. And those are the things that we want to get people talking about, both at home and at work. So it, it, it's it's that constant, you know, the, your presentation today and, and then us taking things from that. If we each just do a little bit and constantly um, uh, remind people of these things, uh, both, as I said, both at home and at work, we're going to make a difference. Um, but it, but we each need to do something. And and as you said, throughout the presentation, there's just it's just little things and it's the way we approach it. Um, and it's it's not coming out in that aggressive manner to say this is wrong or this it is it's about it's about just um, raising the awareness and having the discussion so yeah really enjoyed the presentation and I'm sure that um, because we we've, we've recorded it we'll be able to post that and uh, hopefully it generates further conversation across the broader community. Thank you, Eric. And I think it's you know it's interesting is that those little things they're cumulative aren't they? They add up. And I think over time they have more traction, I guess is my point, is the if we come from a place of humility and we go, I'm not getting it all right, you know, like I'm trying, I'm really trying. It's different if someone is kind of um, consciously provocative, you know, if someone's really bringing it in the sense of they actually just really want to put you down, you know, whether they're being deliberately homophobic, deliberately misogynist, whatever, that's a different thing. But I think most of us are talking about the movable centre. We're not talking about the extremes. We're talking about most of us want to do better. So those challenges, you know, every little bit helps. Yeah. Very good. Well, again, thank you very much for the presentation uh, this evening. And as you said, you've given it from a practical example um, in terms of, you know, um, you know how you see how you see society. It's now now we'll hand it over to to uh, the women's uh, health grampians to give us, 
you know, their examples of how they see it as professionals in the field dealing with this across Western Victoria. So I will introduce the consultants now from, from Women's Health Grampians. Uh, both uh, Melissa and Deb will, will give us a presentation uh, on their perspectives on active bystander, uh, how to be an active bystander. So, you know, what we can do uh, in society to, to, help, um, to help support um, uh, communities around us. So Melissa's worked for local governments in the community sector for over 25 years. She's got extensive experience in community development, community engagement, strategic planning, policy development, and partnerships. And she joined um, Women's Health Grampians as a regional consultant back in 2016 and works with organizations who want to take action to prevent violence against women and advance gender equality. Um, Deb um, gave, uh, again, began her career as a nurse working in Australia and overseas in both first and third world countries where she witnessed uh, many inequalities for people, especially for women and children. She's worked also in the public and private sectors uh, across a number of areas, including clinical training. Deb joined uh, Women's Health Grampians in 2018 and is passionate about the prevention of violence against women and children and uh, how we can all advance gender equality for future generations. So again, we welcome you both and look forward to your presentations. So much, um, Eric, and um, my name's Deb Harris. Um, as Eric said, so I hope that you can all see me. Um, and just to encourage all of you to um, put your questions into chat, I see there are a couple coming in right now. Um, so myself and Melissa will be talking tonight, and I think Melissa is going to be sharing her screen. Um, I think. Um, and um, but first of all, I just really want to acknowledge that I am in fact um, coming to you today from the Wuthering, um, Wuthering country um, and to acknowledge and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. So we're going to talk to you about um, active bystander tips and techniques. Um, so we will try and keep to time, but as I've said, please pop some questions into chat if there's anything, any insights or any questions that you might have. Next slide, Mel. Is that okay. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's working. Thanks, Mel. <laughs> um, all right. The perils of technology, as Nelly has said. Um, so um, what is an active bystander? Well, first of all, I'm going to talk about what is a bystander. So a bystander is a person who is present and witnesses something but doesn't isn't directly involved in it. And when we talk about bystander, we also talk about something called the bystander effect. And so this actually is something that was acknowledged in, I think it was 1964, um, in Queens, in New York, um, so a very crowded city, um, where a 28-year-old woman who was called um, Kitty Genovese was stabbed. And she was um, stabbed multiple times and screamed and pleaded for her life. Um, and when it was discovered what had happened to her, the question was how come this had happened and no one had seen it or no one had acted. And during the course of the investigation, they discovered that in fact there were 38 people who had seen it um, and they had seen and heard the attack and nobody called the police. And the bystander effect is the idea that we all look and think that someone else will take action. And of course, no one did. So what we want to do is to create active bystanders and these are people who obviously take action after witnessing or hearing about an incident of sexist, sexually harassing behaviour or discriminatory behaviour. And it also includes taking action to challenge the culture, the culture that supports sexist and sexually harassing behaviours. But I really also want to note that this is not about um, putting yourself at physical risk. It's not about um, becoming involved in an altercation. Um, it's about assessing the risk um, and doing this in a um, responsible and safe manner. So we don't want to become part of the problem, if you like. Next slide, Mel. I think we've got a lag in slides. That's it. Beautiful. Um, and so why is it so important to be an active bystander? Well, I think all of us have been in the situation where we've been confronted by something and not necessarily, um, you know, of a sexist nature or a discriminatory nature, but we've thought about a situation later that has shocked us or we haven't been prepared for it. And, you know, later on we think, oh, I should have said that or I should have done this. And 
it's hard when you're that person and this is happening to you to actually sometimes respond. So when we're an active bystander, we actually, I guess, give that person a voice um, and we step in um, and intervene. And um, it supports the person emotionally. It discourages the perpetrator. It sends a clear message to the perpetrator that this is not okay. Um, and overall, it contributes to a culture that condemns sexist and sexually harassing behaviours. But um, what we know is that, you know, people sometimes think being a bystander is those um, really overt um, situations where perhaps if someone's being physically assaulted or if there's, you know, um, obvious verbal abuse going on. But what we know is many of the, the precursors to violence against women are not actually crimes in themselves. Um, they're very hard to, um, I guess we can't, we don't have charges for speaking to someone in a demeaning manner. Um, we don't have a charge for necessarily controlling something, although in Scotland we do have coercion um, legislation that is just coming. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to let those behaviours escalate to a point that we would then intervene. We really want to cut them off and nip them in the bud. Um, before they actually escalate to some of those other behaviours. So only a very small proportion of violence comes to the attention of police um, and other relevant authorities. And that's why it's really important for all of us to make sure that we um, highlight those, um, I guess, foundational behaviours that set the scene for violence against women and children. We also know that all of us like to be part of um, a group and we, we look for approval. So by conversely, um, disapproval is a really powerful tool. So when you have someone who is perpetrating violence against women, to feel the disapproval of other people and that that's not okay um, is, is a very powerful um, force. Likewise, to, for the person who is experiencing this violence, to feel that they actually have the support of other people is really powerful also. Next slide now. All right, some of you may have seen this graphic and I noticed in the, um, in the chat, there are a few people that I remember doing um, training with when I trained it um, at your um, establishment um, in terms of ACT at Work, but you, some of you may not have seen this. So this is the, um, the iceberg and there's a few different forms of this graphic. So I wanna be really clear that no one sort of wakes up, I think, um, and says, I'm going to go out and perpetrate violence today. I think um, it's important to note that we have those above the waterline behaviours at the top there of murder, rape, sexual abuse, physical and emotional abuse. And then we have what happens below the waterline, if you like. Um, and sometimes people really struggle to see the link between, you know, it's just a sexist joke or it's just a comment. It's just, you know, um, a, a saying or it's just something that people say. But all of those things have power and they create... Um, and strengthen the underlying foundation of violence against women. So if we look at some of the lower level behaviours below the waterline there, we have sexist comments and jokes. We have the rigid um, gender roles um, and traditional stereotypes that Nellie's talked about. The sexualisation of women and girls. Degrading language. Um, and that is something that just seems to be all too common in our music, in our movies, in our general language. Um, we have the glass ceiling and actually some people um, are still not aware of what that is, but obviously it's an invisible ceiling that prevents women from actually um, achieving their aspirations in terms of their career and their career progression, um, often because they get to a certain point and people assume that because of their caring responsibilities and all the assumptions they make about women in their home life, that they're not able to go further in their career. Gender pay gap, um, we know that women are by and large paid on average 14% less than men across all industries. Some industries are actually more. Um, there are leadership barriers, again, in terms of the numbers of women in leadership. Um, and I always encourage people to actually become leaders, but if you feel that you're not able to, then make sure you support those women in leadership um, because they are the voice of other women. And control and threats. So not everyone that perpetrates these behaviours below the waterline is going to go on to perpetrate the behaviours at the top there. But everyone who has perpetrated the behaviours above that waterline there, so murder, murder, rape, sexual abuse and physical and emotional abuse, will have used these behaviours below. So I think um, it's really important to make that link. And as a bystander, this is why it's so important. 
to nip some of those behaviours in the bud um, at the bottom level there. Next slide, Val. Okay, um, we're going to talk about some of the comments that we hear now. So some of the comments, um, so if we look at some of the sexist jokes and sexist comments that you'll hear, using like a girl, which I think Nellie has talked about as well, um, it's an insult by and large and often it is actually, um, like Nellie said, sometimes it's said without malice, but quite often I'll hear it said with real malice. Um, so, you know, run like a girl, throw like a girl, don't cry like a girl. Um, you don't often hear someone saying, oh, you, you know, you run like a boy. Um, it's just not the same thing. Stop whinging, you sound like a girl. Um, yeah, all those sorts of comments are, um, if you listen in the playground, you'll hear them far more common in relation to a girl. Sexist jokes at the pub, such as, you know, I'll give her eight out of 10. Um, commenting on a woman's appearance, um, commenting in an unfavourable or favourable way in terms of how someone looks. So they're all, it's all about how they look, not about who they are and, and what they contribute. The stereotype that men and boys don't cry, which Nellie has talked about and I think is so important to make sure that women, um, men are able to express their emotions in a functional way and boys also, but also that as women we support them in that also. Comments that transgender women are somehow not real women. Um, and this is, you know, I think we need to acknowledge um, in the world in which we're in now, um, there are many non-binary um, people and that we need to acknowledge that, you know, these are real women, this is how they feel and that's who they are. Parents, um, fathers being congratulated for doing basic parenting tasks, um, such as great job babysitting the kids, and in the case of my own husband, um, because he had to do school pickup a few days in a row, um, someone bought him a casserole because obviously his wife obviously wasn't looking after him well enough. Um, and I found that quite hilarious. Um, I was very happy for the free meal, but I was somewhat shocked. Um, and comments made about a person's suitability for a role based on their gender. So I think it's weird for a guy to be a childcare worker. Um, I think it's weird for a, you know, a woman, for example, to be in construction. Um, we need to get away from those, um, those stereotypes and rigid roles. And obviously, if any of you have any examples, please put them into chat, because I'm always interested to hear what people are, are encountering out in the community. Next slide, Mel. I think All we're right. on to me, Deb. I think you are, yes. Excellent. Okay, thanks everyone. And thanks, Deb. Um, that was great. And look, I think that there's actually been a few links into um, Nellie's presentation earlier, for sure. And, um, you know, the, the previous comment, the, 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 you know, that example, you know, of someone saying, oh, well, that's weird, a guy wanting to be a, a childcare worker, you know, like Nellie, your point around, um, you know, um, that's weird. Um, so anyway, I think that when we talk about taking or being an active bystander, a lot of the evidence and the research that's been done again by organisations such as Vic Health and Our Watch clearly go there's a, a few key things that we need to to do when we're when we're hearing those types of statements that Deb mentioned, or we're in situations where we're you know hearing degrading language, hearing sexist jokes. And or, or 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 demeaning language to towards women, or or needs tips can also be applied in other situations as well. So I guess the first thing, um, and something that's really um important is to actually show it's not okay. So if you're hearing a joke, don't laugh. You know, if someone is kind of in, trying to 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 um encourage you to be involved, show it's not okay, and that you don't support it by using your nonverbal actions. So the, you know, the shaking of the head, the rolling of the eyes, the crossing of the arms, um, or the, the removing yourself away from the situation. So really important to show it's not okay by um, those nonverbal actions. And that's something people are often unsure about how they can be an active bystander because they're worried about confrontation. But, you know, the showing it's not okay Pay is a really subtle, a subtle and and you know I would say a safer um, way to um, be an active bystander. One of the um, 
key sort of next steps, and, and Deb mentioned that earlier about why it's important, is that we know that if by being an active bystander, that it's important that we support the people that may be affected. So the people that may be the targets of the joke or the language or the or the behaviour. Ask if they're okay. You know, check in with them. Check in with them later. You know, um, so important to do because it's not. You know, it's not. They weren't. They were being targeted um, by the behaviour, and so it's important that we support them. Um, and you know, have get have their back is how I've heard that called. Um, and so what we can do is we can ask if they're okay. We can do that at the time, or we may need to you know wait a little bit and to actually check in with that person later. I think the other thing um, with being an active bystander is that um, you know, and and it's a really key part of the bystander effect is that you know we actually think other people are going to do something. Um, and so we sit back and we just wait for someone else to do something. You know, a really key thing that we can do is to actually back up others. So if Deb, you know, says that, you know, oh, gee, I'm not sure what you mean by that, or Nelly, you go, you know, well, that makes no sense to me, you know, back her up, go, yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't get it either, or I don't find that joke to be particularly funny. So really important to back up others. Um, and especially if you're someone that's confident and can go out and, and you know, take bystander action, you know, know that there'll be others around you that are wanting to take action, but they don't know quite what to do or how to do it. If you can back them up and support them, they'll be they'll they'll feel more confident next time. I think the third area that gets um, talked about a lot is the um, speak up. So that's the call it out and definitely one of the key kind of praises in the, this current 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. So speak up to stop disrespect by using tactics like tactics that will diffuse. So they'll kind of try to take the heat out of the situation. So your non-verbals, your humorous comments, the move it right along, those types of, of comments, and we'll, I'll give you some examples in a minute, um, is really important in terms of, of speaking up and or more directly calling it out. So that might be going, yep, that, you know, you, you that may be, Nelly, that might be your kind of blow shit up um, uh, analogy, um, is to actually directly call it out and say it's not okay and that you don't support what's being said and to maybe then even explain why. I think what the evidence is showing more and more is that no action is saying that the behaviour is okay. So really by not doing anything, by laughing along, by really, we're actually condoning that behaviour. So whether it is, you know, um, those, as Deb had showed you with the iceberg, you know, we know that that all contributes to a, a culture that enables um, some people to commit acts of violence against women. So we need to, to take action um, at this level. I'm going, and, and people may have seen, and um, I think given the time we, we won't play it, but people may have seen this ad on television of this, this guy on the train um, talking about, you know, seeing um, somebody uh, staring or, uh, at a woman and making her clearly um, visibly uncomfortable. Um, he's, in, he's witnessing it, he's seeing it, so he's a bystander. It's not directly affecting him. But what he does is he kind of goes that he maybe did that that test of, oh, that's a bit weird. She looks uncomfortable. I'm not okay with this. You know, is it is it is it bad? Is it is it okay? No, it's weird. And what he did was he then decided to step in um, and block the line of vision. And clearly, by that non-verbal action, uh, um, clearly showing that it's not okay. Um, and then you know the fellow stops the fellow stops doing it. So I think um, when we when we talk about being an active bystander, I think people are often a little um, you know think that it has to be confrontational. It doesn't. And this is I think a really good example of also action being taken in an area that is probably safe. Um, so Nelly earlier highlighted also that you know violence 
um, in a public realm or in a public place like a pub or on public transport can be very, very different. And so we need to be cautious of that. And I think that's a great example. Um, so I talked about some examples of, you know, how to diffuse the situation um, and that that's a really important and a key initial step that we need to undertake. So what do we actually mean by that? So those statements like, you know, um, can you say that again? Or if someone says a joke, you know, can you say that again? I didn't quite hear that. And they're unlikely to maybe repeat it again because they're getting the sense that already it's not quite funny. People aren't, aren't behind what I'm doing. You know, asking a question. Um, I, don't, I don't really know what you mean by that. Or, you know, the example that Nelly gave earlier, you know, ask why. So just sort of say that makes no sense to me or I don't understand that. Can you explain that again? And again, people are um, likely to get the sense that it's not okay. I mean, so yeah, so what do you mean by X, Y and Z, you know? So they're kind of those questioning ways are probably quite safe and, um, you know, some of the more straightforward ways of helping to diffuse a situation. And something that's more stronger, you know, the statement of around, I don't feel um, okay hearing something like that or I'm not really comfortable. Or in a workplace, people are more likely to just go, yeah, that's not okay in our workplace. So you can actually, you know, using those I statements help um, not blame the person, not blame the person that's saying it, but it's actually more a reflection of your standards and, and how you feel about it. I think that, um, you know, we can also try to, you know, in a social setting or, you know, um, we can try to also stop what's being said and what's happening and actually move it right along. And that might then also give us the time to check in with the with the person that's being targeted and also check in with the person that's saying it at a later time when it may be more appropriate to go there. So these are actually some things I've come across during the 16 days of activism myself, um, which I'll add into my list of things to say, you know, so, if, if you're in a situation, you can just say, oh, look, let's not go there, um, move it along, you know, so did you see the game last night? So they're good examples of how you can maybe show that it's not okay, but move it on and it's not threatening and it's not pointing the finger and it's not making people feel awkward at the time. Um, some other examples, um, again, which might be starting to elevate it more to the sort of calling it out or, and speaking up is to actually really, you know, calmly disagree um, and, and state that the comment is wrong or unacceptable. So, you know, you might say, and it, it's about picking your, your, your timing, that I know you probably didn't mean it, but I found what you said to be offensive. And that's something that really could be said after the, after the event as well. And I know that sometimes when people hear things, witness things, or even laugh along at jokes, they often feel bad about it and reflect on it. And then you could say something like that afterwards. I think you, also a key thing is, you know, speaking up and educating. So explaining why you disagree with something. So, so that's really about call it out and educate. So you could really say that, you know, if, if for example, a statement like, Actually, evidence shows that the vast majority of women do not make up false claims of sexual assault. And you could, you know, that's a sort of a fairly um, uh, closed statement. You know, challenging people's logic. So that's not my experience or what makes you think that or, you know, ask, you know, that makes no sense to me are all ways that we can help be an active bystander, I guess, by challenging that language and or, or behaviour. I think some other things that are key um, is to certainly check in with the target at the time or afterwards. And also the same, you know, follow up with the person who's been, been saying that or undertaking that behaviour at the time or afterwards. You know, we don't have to always do things in the heat of the moment or when things are awkward um, or when you're at Christmas lunch you can actually do it um, afterwards um, as well. Um, I think just 
um, conscious of the time. What I will just also highlight, and I know um, that the council will be providing some info as well, is, you know, that this happens in the online world as well. And, you know, so it's so important to be um, an active bystander online. And I'd really encourage everyone to just go to Genvic. Um, .org.au and have a look at their online active bystander project where they have got a, a sheet which has some tips on how we can actually do this online um, by using really some of those same principles of diffusing um, of, you know, am I the only one who feels uncomfortable about this? So recruiting and getting others on board. So a really, really good example of how we can um, be a an active bystander in the online world. So I know that we had a lot more things to cover, but I'm thinking it's it's nearly um, nearly time, and I think that's probably um, quite a good spot to to finish up on. Um, or I might just put one more slide up. So you know, really, our key things, our key actions, as being an active bystander, diffuse the situation with a light-hearted comment or non-verbal. Check in with the target. Are you okay? Can I help? Call it out. In a workplace, you've got reporting systems, and/or even, um, you know, we can report to the police if need be in in situations of of physical and other abuse. And we know that no action is saying that the behaviour is okay. Um, so I might stop there and stop sharing the screen and hand back over um, to Eric or we, we can see if there's any questions in the chat. Oh, thank you very much, Melissa and Deb. And there's lots of comments in the chat and I think um, we've been reading, reading them as they've been, they've been coming up. Um, you've really shown how we can make a difference and contribute to, contribute to achieving greater uh, gender equity and also reducing gender based violence. And I think, um, you know, it, it's clear it's, it's, it's not easy sometimes. And, you know, some people will feel uncomfortable at calling it out. But I think you've, you've shown that we can provide people both within our organizations and within our communities, our families and everything else, the tools that can make it a little bit easier. And it, it's not something that has to be, you know, um, and, you know, as, as Nellie mentioned it, there's different degrees on the ways you can approach it. Um, sometimes you really do need, you know, to confront something and others you can do it in a softly, softly manner. But the whole point here is about is about feeling comfortable and, and make it almost to normalize calling it out. Yeah. Uh, and regardless, regardless of the degree at, at which it's done. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, these presentations help to better inform, better equip everyone to, to, to make that difference. Um, I know Nellie had mentioned, you know, we've come a long way in two generations. I guess from my perspective, hopefully it doesn't take us another two to get to where we feel really comfortable as a, as a society. Um, I'm pretty confident with, with us uh, addressing it in, in, in forums like this and especially in the workplace where it probably wasn't done in the past. We're, we're having the conversations that people um, take home with them. So I think it's really important that we continue to do that. So again, thank you uh, both the two of you and, and, and Nelly as well for the, for the presentations tonight. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to everyone and hopefully, as I said before, we can take the video of, of this and, and present it further uh, beyond within our within our own community. Um, I also also need to say a big shout out to Felicity um, for organizing tonight's session, but also um, the session that we had today during the uh, this morning actually with our staff. I think there was over 50 staff that were on the Zoom meeting this morning where we had a similar conversation. Um, so again, thank you very much, Felicity. Uh, I know you haven't you've been with the organization only a short period of time, and and most of it's been at working from home. So you've done a fantastic job, and thank you very much for all the hard work and effort that you put into uh, all day today to this morning session and to tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Eric, and thanks so much to Nally, Deb, and Melissa. Um, I definitely got a lot out of your presentation. I'm sure everyone else. Um, has as well and thank you for letting us record it so we can um, circulate it to some other staff who didn't get the opportunity to be here tonight so thank you so much
Well, perfect timing. You you landed right on nine o'clock. You said it was going to go from seven thirty to nine. You you've done extremely well. Again, thank you very much uh, to everyone, and hopefully all those that were watching uh, enjoyed themselves and can take a little bit out of this and and make a difference um, in their own in their own lives. So thank you again, and hopefully everyone um, enjoyed it and take care. Thank you.